starting off looking at a painting that was completely holy by Leonardo is this Annunciation, which is now in Uffizi in Florence, but which was made for the convent of Montoliveto. It is a typical scene uh, of the angel arriving on the left, just in front of the Virgin, holding a lily, which is a symbol of Virgin's, um, of sorry, of Mary's virginity, but also a symbol of the city of Florence. And you can already see in the angel himself the interest in light and shadow, especially in the angel's drapery. And that sort of links us back to the Virgin's drapery and this figure, which is very majestic, very monumental, and very almost sculptural figure, both in the way she's uh, sort of seated, but in particular in the way the folds of, the clo of her clothes and the drapery are rendered. I think it is clear that the influence of Verrocchio here is paramount, and that is particularly true for the antique style pedestal of the Virgin's reading desk, and for those sculptural draperies that I just pointed out. Uh, the ledger, which is um, it almost seems done in marble and really achieves a high level of details in all the decorative features of it. The painting has been sort of unequally divided, and a third of the painting on our sort of horizontal level um, is, for the, is for the Virgin, which has got this building behind her that almost protects her. Um, so she's enclosed by this building, and in a way, is a reference to the Hortus Conclusus in a different way, so a reference to her virginity, her purity again. If we then follow the building, you can see the wall, um, this sort of ledge, and you can see this the break in the wall towards just off of the centre towards the left. And that is a, a break that allows us or allows Leonardo to draw attention to the gesture of the angel. And the way the painting does have a geo geometric quality to it, but there is a wonderful flow which is communicated by the hands of the protagonist and a lovely lightness and transparency of it. There is also uh, generally a, a great um, interest in the meadows, in the plants, in the trees and in the landscape, in all this different, starting from the very foreground and going all the way um, down to the landscape. And starting from the foreground, this is a little detail of the meadow next to a drawing from the Royal Collection Trust, which uh, shows the clump um, of the Sarah Bethlehem. Now, this is a later drawing, and so here I'm not saying that the drawing is a preparatory drawing for this painting. What I'm just trying to show, this is one of several drawings of plants that Leonardo made in preparation for a painting destroyed probably around 1700 of the Lead and the Swan, to which I will go back. Um, the idea is that he starts looking at uh, flowers and plants in this particular instance, but more generally at nature for his paintings. But then it goes, this goes, his interest goes far beyond what was needed, what was necessary for the painting. And here he's paying close attention to the form of the Spurgeous flowers, which of course um, is in a way abstracted from what was the idea of the painting. But it's just to show, as he did, that that very first sketch that we looked at, the nature and landscape are very much um, in Leonardo's mind. Now, the um, the landscape of which you're looking at um, at a detail and next to it, I'm, I'm putting again that pen and ink study just to remind ourselves that this was something that Leonardo was particularly engaged in. The landscape is treated with the aerial or atmospheric perspective of that you know is one of the sort of trademarks of Leonardo, if I can say so. So that is a technique that creates the illusion of depth and distance by depicting distant object as paler, as blurry, as less detailed, and normally they are bluer than uh, and, and is a sort of a cold blue than the objects that are closer to us. In that way, not just reducing the size of the objects, which was typical of the, of the perspective of the time, but also changing the appearance and the color of them and making them less defined, captures the effect the, the air and atmosphere have on the appearances of the objects when we're looking at them from a distance. And this blue haze, this sort of very cold blue haze of the mountains, indicate that as a way of communicating distance, he was also aware of what was happening in Netherlandish art. Now, when we look at the painting, there seems to be some sort of perspective or perspective errors, in particular uh, on the Virgin, on her right arm, which seems to be longer than the left one, and the leg seems to be too short if compared to her waist. But also, I think you can probably notice straight away that the tree, which is a cypress, which is right next to the building, sort of on the right side of the painting, seem almost blends in with this 15th century lovely architecture and makes it look um, even larger. 
So that seemed to be something, you know, sort of those details to be a bit off for Leonardo. But starting off from an idea of Carlo Pedretti, which was one of the leading uh, scholars uh, of Leonardo who uh, passed away a few years ago, this perspective error would actually be intentional. Uh, because if we look at the enunciation from a lateral perspective, from a lateral position to the right, the disproportion of the arm and the legs is attenuated, um, and it is the same with the cypress, which looks much more in line as it should be. This is due to something that is called anaphemism, which is another technique, an optical technique, which was already used by the Florentine masters, and we know that Leonardo knew of it because we have found a note of this in his studies. So it is possible that he has chosen to use this adaptation to tally better with the location of the work, which perhaps was meant to be um, along a high wall and was meant to be viewed in foreshortening from the right. The anaphemism may be something that you're familiar with if you know the painting of Hans Holbein in the National Gallery of the Ambassadors with the skull in the foreground that is uh, made as an anaphemism, meaning that you can only completely appreciate it wholly or make sense of it from a particular position. I'm also showing you two drawings, which are actually preparatory drawings for the drapery studies, as we've looked at draperies quite a bit from the start. The one of the draperies of the Virgin from the Louvre and the one of the drapery of the arm of the Angel from Christ Church in Oxford. And you get the delicacy of the indication of shadow and light. In the Louvre, I think you do get that complexity of the, of the drawing. And there is that feature that um, basically the highlights, they run over the edges of the drapery and they get their maximum power, maximum power and intensity on the pinches of the folds as they would if, the, if this was a, a, was a drapery on a metal, on a sculpture. Again, to go back to the idea of three dimension and sculptural quality of the drapery, which I tried to show in the painting and which is, a, is, is already something that we can see in the drawing. 